now we are having in the first session the first speaker will be uh, dr manush pratim dash so i have the privilege to introduce him uh, dr manush pratim dash uh, has been in the field of science communication for nearly 3 decades he did his msc in physics from uh, jadavpur university and later on his phd in history of science from the same institution he joined all india radio in the year 1994 and since then has been working tirelessly to produce and present popular science programs for spreading scientific awareness in the society one of his programs that stand out uh, is the live phone in program on fm titled bigyan roshiket dorbare i ran for 20 uninterrupted years that's very interesting and has no parallel in south asia his radio productions has been honored with akashvani annual award several times He is a prolific author and has penned a good number of popular science books. Dr. Dash is an independent researcher in the history of science and technology. He is a fellow of the West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology and also a council member of the Indian Science News Association. He has received state and national awards from the Department of Science and Technology of the respective governments for its his uh, very good initiatives. he is a prolific speaker also i can tell you that i had the opportunity uh, to listen to talks in some occasions and i'm quite sure that uh, the audience will enjoy and will get a good amount of information from his talk today he will be delivering today his talk on geometry as it happened so i request kindly dr manush pratim dash please start your talk thank you please uh Okay. Uh, uh, good morning to all, and thanks, Professor Ghosh, for the wonderful introduction, which I hardly deserve. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Robir Gharami, for having me in this uh, webinar. I thank the college authorities, the principal, and the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity. now as uh, professor ghosh has rightly pointed out i am not a practicing mathematician what i am is an independent researcher in the history of uh, in the discipline of history of science so i uh, would limit my uh, presentation to that and uh, as you have already learned from uh, professor ghosh our chair that uh, my topic today is geometry as it happened uh and in this webinar where there are very uh, learned people uh, from uh, our country as well as abroad speaking on very uh, crucial aspects of mathematics what i am going to do would be a bit of uh, uh, would have a bit of difference in that i would actually take you uh, along a walk around the garden of geometry uh not literally a bird's eye view you will be able to know the trees uh the birds their chirp in some way in uh, in a limited way i would say but still it might be might be I, again i stress that point it might be interesting to some of the listeners uh so without much ado let's go about my presentation i would just uh take a few seconds to start my presentation please bear with me as i prepare my presentation here okay uh the powerpoint coming up uh in a few seconds I don't know today uh, whether it is the net connection or the or my laptop that is giving some problems. Uh, Professor Ghosh, is it uh, visible? The PowerPoint is it visible now? Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, so I'll I'll switch on to uh, full screen. Uh, okay, okay then. and i would uh, request uh, one and all uh, including our respected chair 
so please point out if any uh, discrepancies occur and anything goes wrong uh, as far as visibility and audibility is concerned uh, kindly point it out to me so that i may make amendments and uh, go along as okay, desired yeah, okay, thank you uh, now geometry as it happened i mean uh, everything has a history it is not our kings and emperors and queens who have a history the common man on the street the way he is walking the way he is speaking the way he is going about teaching his children uh, shopping and uh, doing calculations on the spot all has a history and geometry is no exception to that and uh, we can all understand that uh, geometry would have a different history in the sense that along with the simple narrative it would have some calculations some drawings now in this uh, limited period presentation i won't be able to cover everything and uh, that is not my wish as well and i don't have the uh, in fact uh, that is not my target so what i'll uh, do is start at the beginning you might find that there are uh, biases in this in this presentation in fact i might point out some biases in the presentation and later on you might enrich me with your comments uh, suggesting where uh, i can improve the presentation where i can improve my uh, concept of the history of geometry now uh, geometry if you go by the uh, european account started uh, in egypt now why why egypt only why not uh, in other parts of the country the europeans since they were very keen on uh, i mean every every king or emperor is keen on uh, occupying other territories and uh, say and alexander also liked egypt uh, for the land for the for all the diamonds all the uh, jewels all the riches that were available and so the greeks actually marched into egypt so egypt was the closest that they could go in africa and so they did and uh, there are uh, interesting stories about how uh, alexander uh, uh, had set up his uh, so called institutes in egypt before he returned and egypt was loved by one and all not only uh, alexander later on even in the uh, late 18th and early 19th century napoleon loved egypt as well so now the ancient egyptians are said to have started geometry i mean you might not conquer with me when i say this but it is said that ancient egyptian demonstrated the practical knowledge now geometry when it, there is a metric thing metric part added to any word uh, you uh, generally conclude that it has to do something with uh, measurement calculation but it is not always so because when we go over to projective geometry we would see that uh, not necessarily geometry is associated with uh, a metric field not necessarily but anyway the nile river uh, which is uh, which is the i mean the identity of the land of egypt overflowed its banks every year and the river banks should have to be resurveyed because everyone has uh, his land uh, pieces of land demarcated and those uh, lands uh, if you claim that that land is mine uh, the boundary has been washed away you are putting uh, your fence in a wrong way uh, you are uh, encroaching on my land naturally there will be uh, first some uh, scuffles and later on might be full blown war so to avoid that they used to measure the land every year and <laughs> that way they were in need of some way of measuring uh, the field and that gave rise to geometry so i mean this is a very uh, simplistic way of describing the birth of geometry there are other ways as well now uh, see if it is egypt this is uh, circa 2000 to 500 bc and when we move over to babylonians babylonians as you all know uh, occupied uh, the land which is which can roughly be equated with iraq today so the babylonians were uh, in fact every civilization is in need of some form of mathematics and that mathematics would include geometry as well so the babylonians were no exceptions again 
and they had to uh, devise something on their own because uh, though there were uh, exchanges between different civilizations, but uh, it can be assumed that there were not so much of travel between uh, different uh, countries as it existed then. And so there was not much of exchange in uh, terms of um, mathematical knowledge. So they had to devise it uh, on their own. And ancient clay tablets, which give us some proof of how the Babylonians went about the work. Uh, there is one clay tablet. I mean, there are so many examples. Uh, there are uh, some scripts as well that we can, uh, some other day we can uh, discuss. Now, one clay tablet uh, reads that four is the land and five is the diagonal. What is the bread? This is simply the Pythagorean principle, and uh, you can understand that it, this uniform tablet from Yale University tries to uh, drive us uh, to a point where we should understand that the uh, type of thing that Pythagoras dealt with were already there. So the Babylonians were, uh, I mean, this, this uh, right angle thing, right angle triangle, trying to uh, deduce the length of the hypotenuse with the length of the other side. Those were uh, in vogue. Those were uh, being calculated. And now, uh, as we move on, you'll see that almost everyone uh, is on firm ground claiming that they had discovered what Pythagoras did in a, in a much later period. And that is very interesting. But before that, I would uh, give a blown up picture of that, that uh, that tablet, this is the thing that you had already seen in the last slide. Here is a blown up tablet. They didn't use our decimal system of uh, counting. And uh, these, these, uh, these nails are, uh, these are very significant nails. If you go into any, uh, go through any book of uh, history of uh, science or history of geometry, you'd find these are explained. Now, this is a uh, 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 sexagesimal figures. Those who know it very well would understand. And the uh, calculation, the calculation uh, of, uh, of uh, root 2 that comes out is uh, correct to six decimal digits. Then it, of course, deviates. Now, the tablet also gives an example where one side of the square is 30 and the resulting diagonal is, again, uh, in six uh, decimal style. And it comes out to this. And you can understand. So uh, this is the way. Uh, the Pythagoras, uh, Pythagorean calculation is done. Now, this is again, again another uh, tablet. If, if you tell uh, that the speaker only dwelt on the Pythagorean uh, formula, uh, that would uh, not be very pleasing to me. So I uh, chose to uh, put in some other slides as well. This is uh, a cuneiform tablet dating again uh, 350 to 50 BC. This is the period. You cannot just pinpoint it was 312 season. Uh, 40, not like that. This is not possible. So with carbon dating and other things as well, if there is no carbon, how can you do carbon dating again? So with other methods, you can uh, do some calculation. And this is between 350 and 50 BC. Now, Matthew Osenbridge were of the Humboldt University in Berlin. He found the tablet. And he says what he understands from the given picture. See, we lay people won't be able to understand what is this. Uh, some uh, some uh, design, of course. But it doesn't reveal anything to us. But a person trained in these type of things, like the one I'm talking about, Matthew was in the bridge he found and he understood that the trapezoid, there are some trapezoids here. And uh, uh, it is trying to find uh, an area under a curve. Now, today, this is very simple. Everyone knows that a, a school kid knows that. But at that point of time in history, it was not so easy. And this helps in deducing the distance traveled by Jupiter, mind it. So they were doing actually astronomy. So they were trying to understand how much distance Jupiter, Jupiter was a large planet. Almost even in today's time, if you don't tell a kid what Jupiter is, whether it is a planet or a star, uh, he or she <laughs> will um, uh, mistake it for a uh, uh, star might be, and Jupiter is so large, so everyone was interested in Jupiter. And this is the way we generally uh, calculate the area covered by a curve, and from that we can go over to the length as well. And the area is given by, you know, these are, I mean, those who are studying 
even in the first year of uh, the graduate course in, in BSc, uh, or even uh, BA in, in several courses, mathematics is included. So you know what is this? I mean, how to calculate this? Uh, if a, if it's x uh, x axis, uh, the function is dependent on x. F1 plus F2, you get the average height, and then you multiply it by the different delta x. So you go on like that with every trapezoid, and you go like that and find the what is the what is the result. So this is the way it is done. It's a simple delta x is everywhere, just one, and f x is like that. Simple. Now, so people like uh, uh, the Babylonians, uh, they also uh, indulged in astronomy and not only astronomy, they not only wondered how it is being done, how it is being uh, carried on, they also tried to calculate the path uh, traversed by the, the planet Jupiter and how much path it actually traced out. Now, coming to the... Uh, Hindu mathematics, Hindu uh, geometry system of things. Uh, of course, in the Vedic times, there were mathematics and there are mentions of, of mathematics being done uh, in several uh, scriptures, I mean faintly, and especially in uh, the Vedangas, not in the Vedas, especially in the Vedangas. There were six Vedangas and one of the six Vedangas is of course uh, Jyotisha. And that also involved a lot of calculation. But uh, scholars who have done a lot of work in these fields uh, try to say that the most uh, important part as far as geometry is concerned is the Sulva Sutra. Sulva Sutra, again, Sulva means a rope. So Sulva Sutra means measuring with a rope. Again, it takes us back to the times of uh, the Egyptians, where we have uh, already said that the Egyptians needed some way of measuring land after the Nile overflew every year and uh, uh, some just washed away the boundaries between pieces of land. So that was needed. But Sulva Sitra was not uh, uh, essentially concerned with uh, measuring lands only. It had some uh, lofty ideals if we can put that under quotes. And the thing is that uh, here, here, we, here, here, here is a, a photo from uh, uh, Stephen Hawking's uh, uh, very well-known book, God Created Integers, where he says that before Pythagoras, uh, Indians had uh, already discovered how to uh, calculate that have hypotenuse. So Pythagoras was uh, didn't do anything new. But again, here uh, after having mentioned Edmund Bach, etc., etc., uh, Stephen Hawking points out that we must be very Albert Bach. I'm, I'm sorry, it should be Albert Bach, not Edmund Bach. We should be very careful in these pieces of history where we should understand that. Uh, uh, Every information that a historian comes up with should be uh, investigated uh, for uh, its uh, correctness and we should not take it at face value. So it is not an essential that uh, really uh, the Indians had uh, overtaken the Greeks or had uh, done the Pythagorean thing much earlier. But anyway, Sulva Sutra is much more than the Pythagorean formula. Uh, it uh, pertained to building altars of different sizes. Uh, now, altars meaning uh, uh, where uh, the the the, uh, the uh, yes uh, uh, the deities are uh, uh, worship. Now, Professor Ghosh, just give me just one second. There's some uh, something to attend to. Just give me one second. I'll back with the presentation. Just give me. Hello.
Uh, I am sorry for the break, uh, but when you remain at home, there are other problems that crop up often. Uh, Professor Ghosh, am I audible again? Yeah, yeah, you plan. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I had to leave the presentation. Okay, it's not uh, okay. a problem. Yeah, of course, it happens. Okay. Perhaps. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for understanding uh, the situation. Okay. Uh, now, uh, the Sulva Sutra uh, is generally the credit is assigned to uh, Baudhayana, Apastampa, and Kaptana. Now, as I have already pointed out, that the Sulva Sutra uh, had more to do with uh, designing altars, but there is a, another explanation to it that the Sulva Sutra didn't arise from the need of uh, erecting altars. Uh, actually, during the uh, uh, in the civilization, there were several constructions that required uh, different geometry, not just straight lines and circles. And you had to equate the area of a, a straight uh, of a circle with that of a square. I mean, you had to try to come as close as you could. So, one might say that uh, 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 this uh, Sulva Sutra actually originated in the Indus civilization, but that again uh, creates a debate in history, when did it originate? Now, Devi Prasad Chattopadhyay, who is a very famous uh, historian of uh, science and technology in our country, uh, whose teacher was, of course, uh, S.N. Das Gupta, uh, another great philosopher. Now, he has uh, tried to say that the Sulba Sutras was, were not necessarily connected with uh, creating uh, these altars or uh, designing these altars. But without going into that debate, without going uh, much deeper, let us try to understand what is that we are trying to say, what uh, is that we are trying to point out. Now, Baudhayana gives a very interesting construction for a circle, as you can see on the right of my slide here. Uh, this is taken from a book uh, by a very well-known author of history of science. Uh, he's, he, he hails from Bangalore. Now, uh, where Baudhana says, if you wish to circle a square, draw half of it diagonal about the center towards the east-west line, dot, dot, dot. You can see the construction here. Uh, the way it is taken, if, if, it is, if it gets recorded as I present it, you can later on... Uh, spend your time in understanding what is written here, or you can find the, the book. So, uh, with the third part that which lies outside the square. But, but, he says that finally, I'll come to the pie thing later. Finally, he says that Apastamba says, that is, I already pointed out, there is uh, three towering figures, both Hana, Apastamba and Kaktana. All of them did Sulva Sutras. Apastamba points out that the circle thus contracted is anitya, meaning it is approximate. It is, it is not exact. So even to this day, we know that it is not possible to build an ex exact uh, circle like that, uh, which would be absolutely equal. Now, Vedic people did that thousands of years ago. But if, if you take it to the Indus the civilization, then, of course, uh, the dates will vary and the origination of uh, the Sulpa Sutras would uh, also vary in time. But anyway, this is the way they tried to uh, do geometry, start with this. Uh, suppose someone had said that, okay, uh, next time the DT, Again, there might be debate because there was no deity in the first part of uh, the Vedic era. Uh, powers that are beyond our uh, beyond our control, 
that could be said that these powers would be uh, very pleased if you actually build an altar which is uh, in the shape of a circle but what you did last time you did uh, it uh, in the form of a square the area should be the same now if someone some say some priest gives such an explanation or such a um, message to to the person who is uh, offering sacrifices and other things to the deity or the unknown forces he might be impressed and he might be scared that if we don't do it this way uh, the unknown powers might be uh, very much offended with me and uh, curses will come down from heavens so that is the cultural part that the cultural part of the thing but the geometry went uh, around like this and uh, they arrived at a figure of pi which is 3.088 now this is pretty close to what we are doing these days pretty close to what value we have in fact the value of pi it has a different history altogether and one can spend hours on this uh, speaking about how the value of pi changed in different uh, civilizations but came very close to 3 point something so the vedic contribution was like that now coming to the greeks ancient greeks what they did was uh, put geometry uh, into a form which is very systematic uh, even european scholars these days point out that the greeks didn't invent much but what they did was keep it systematic keep it for the later generation for the later civilization to understand and use it for their own purpose now the thing is the most uh, important uh, geometer in greek civilization was euclid we'll come to euclid we'll come to his elements because his elements form the basis of geometry for the next 2000 years he uh, say uh, 400 bc or 300 bc he might have uh, compiled his elements at that point of time for the next 2000 years that was the book which you had to go by that was the way i mean the, the way the, the the bible in every civilization and later on this was preserved by the arabs whose civilization rose to a very appreciable height it started uh, in uh, in europe or in say my you might say in modern turkey again there is elaborate history on this it is possible to uh, discuss in detail the contribution of the arabs and the way they not only preserved the contribution of the greeks in the later years they also contributed to it handsomely and uh, that is also being used by us in modern days now euclid's elements uh, or geometry here is a, a photograph i don't think that every uh, book will contain this photograph euclid's elements have uh, so many uh, thousands of edition uh, through different uh, decades so you might find a different one when you lay your hand on uh, such a book it has some axioms and postulates of euclid you have already uh, studied it in uh, your school uh, days and that is uh, these again if you want uh, ask me when i present this to school kids high school kids they ask me what is the difference of axioms and postulates in fact to this day i haven't found any difference whether from the etymological point or from the technical mathematical point i haven't found really any difference so these axioms or postulates were uh, they said euclid invented it many say euclid actually collected it and put it in a systematic manner in his book the elements now axioms are things uh, which are equal to the same things are equal to one another if equals are added to equal the whole are equal these are axioms you all know now uh, there's one story there uh, and some historians say this is a romantic story that pascal blaise pascal you uh, know he will also appear in, in my presentation later blaise pascal had uh, discovered in fact this this version of the story was given Uh, by his sister that uh, blaise pascal was so intelligent he died at a very young age he was very intelligent and he discovered the all all the uh, postulates of euclid at the age of 14 this was not really correct uh, people don't uh, believe it but anyway and he did it independently so one might say that euclid did it independently others might say that euclid actually collected it 
always you have debates in history euclid uh, doesn't go beyond uh, the <laughs> purview of the debate now all right angles are equal to one another a circle can be drawn with any center any radius these are postulates now where euclid had a problem was with his fifth postulate i didn't put the postulates in 1 2 3 4 man i should have been uh, like that but his fifth postulate was that uh, with, with with the parallel things if a line segment intersects two straight lines forming two interior angles you know what to say that uh, if it is less than two right angles then the two lines that extend infinitely meet on the side on which the angles sum to less than two right angles there is another version to it there's a playfair's it is called playfair's axiom where to say that uh, uh, if you have a line and a point not on it the at most one line parallel to the given line can be drawn through the point now euclid was not very happy with this in the sense that he couldn't prove it one might ask did he prove the other postulate because postulates are not to be proven actually again there is a debate i won't go into that but the fifth postulate controversy remains and since euclid could not prove it he was not satisfied with accepting his own fifth postulate but he saw that it's happening like that on the plane surface with which he did geometry we would see that geometry is not necessarily concerned with plane surfaces it can happen on curved surfaces surfaces and our planet or other planets are spherical in nature or elliptical uh, if you uh, want to do it uh, uh, state it in a very, very general manner and there euclid's fifth postulate doesn't hold then the, the mathematicians in the next centuries unsuccessfully attempted to prove euclid's fifth it didn't happen given a line and a point not on the line it is possible to draw exactly and this again we all always say that uh, failure uh, failures are the pillars of success and in fact this failure actually gave us a success which can be named as um, elliptical geometry or hyperbolic uh, geometry like that now before going into that we'll uh, come to pythagoras pythagoras was a figure about whom very little is known it is not possible to tell if pythagoras is the actual author of the discovery but again it is said Uh, those who want to weave stories they had um, given us some uh, anecdotes that pythagoras sacrificed 100 oxen in fact rituals were associated with uh, mathematics in every civilization because at that point time religion had not uh, lost its uh, controlling power on the society uh, it, 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 it was the control was very strong and the pythagoreans wrote many why the pythagoreans because that there was a school naturally a towering figure like pythagoras would have a great number of followers and that would come uh, get united as a school so the pythagoreans uh, wrote many geometric proofs uh, but again it is difficult to ascertain who proved what but or who collected what and it, even it is said in stephen hawking's book that uh, albert burke said that that pythagoras did visit uh, india and he collected uh, the proofs uh, from here no one can say whether it is correct or not but there was a vow of secrecy whatever you do you there is retain it within your school you don't allow others beyond the uh, school to know that and uh, see what happened from that again this is an anecdote don't uh, believe it literally that using the pythagorean principles you can uh, actually uh, do something uh, construct something which is called the square root spiral you start with a triangle which is just uh, in length 1 1 and then want to construct the hypotenuse then again take hypotenuse and the side with 1 again the hypotenuse increases in length and you can go with that spiral but after that doing such a thing they found they were landing in some uncertain territory they were getting some uh, things that could not be divided into discrete units without discrete units with a, without some number that could be divided in, into discrete units nothing was possible for them so they called these numbers allogon which means unutterable 
uh, and they were very shocked uh, that uh, these numbers uh, were not uh, uh, easy to handle. But what they did was, again, this is an anecdote, that they put to death a member who dared to mention their existence to the public. One of uh, the, one, uh, one fellow in the group was uh, a traitor and he was uh, thrown into the sea when uh, it was discovered that he had leaked the, leaked the discovery of this allogon, which we call, call the, as, referred to as square root thing these days. They take, called it unutterable. Now, uh, I'd skip this because Pythagoreans, it is said that they had given uh, uh, triples, the formula for uh, inventing triples, and Euclid again uh, in his elements had put these tri triples uh, in a neat way. And these are the triples, m square minus n square, 2m n, n square plus n square. These are general things. So I'd skip that, not go much into this. Apollonius is a very, uh, very uh, mentionable figure because he had discovered conic section and without conic section, you cannot go further into the discussion of uh, geometry. Uh, and Apollonius did that. He hailed from Perga and that's why he's called Apollonius of Perga. Uh, his time period was 240 to roughly 190 BC, again. BC, of course. He was called the great geometer who treatise conics. That is again a very useful work. And again, you can ask: uh, Is there anyone contemporary to Apollonius who had uh, discovered conics? Of course, there are, but the history is very shady and it's very difficult to uh, come up with the names. So we would uh, stay content with Apollonius and say that, yes, uh, his conics gave us the idea of uh, this thing, this peculiar thing, uh, which we didn't know earlier. And he was, uh, he can justly be credited with this. And Apollonius, I would say that he went uh, further than doing very simple things. Uh, in fact, conic sections are, you know what, what conic sections are. Uh, if you, if you cut a cone at uh, different angles, the thing you get, those are conic sections. If you cut it with a plane surface, what you get is a conic section. From that, you can get a circle, an ellipse, uh, the parabola, and the hyperbola. Now, uh, Apollonius did all that. But whereas his predecessors had used finite right circular cones, well structured right circular cones, instead of that, he extended the discussion, he extended the view, and uh, he used the arbitrary double cones, which were oblique. Even here, it is not oblique. He used arbitrary double cones and made it so general. I mean, the word general is so dear to every scientist, especially in physics and mathematics, uh, in other sciences as well. Uh, the word general is so in, uh, of so great value, so dear to us, that unless you do something general, a specific solution to something would not be very acceptable. So Apollonius considered arbitrary oblique double cones and extended indefinitely uh, in both direction, as can be seen from the figure, and that was made much more general. I won't say that that was the limit of our knowledge of conics, but he had given us, uh, he had shown us the right path uh, on which to proceed. Now, you cannot uh, uh, leave out the school to which Socrates, uh, Plato, Aristotle belong. And out of them, Plato holds a special place. Aristotle also comes into the picture. In some way. Now, the plat Platonic solids, these are of interest to us when we are discussing the history of geometry. Any of the five geometric solids whose faces are all identical, regular polygons, meeting the same three-dimensional angle, uh, these were of interest to them. See, in the uh, course of our discussion till now, I had uh, once mentioned the word romantic uh, in connection to Blaise Pascal's story. But people are... Uh, by nature, romantic. They want to associate uh, animated stories with inanimate objects. 
and that was especially true uh, during uh, those years to which plato or socrates belonged uh, it has not gone away today when we write history uh, well, so sorry when we compose poetry we are doing the same thing we are putting uh, life into inanimate objects we are uh, weaving stories around them and don't think that the process of composing poetry is completely disconnected with the process of mathematics or, or the uh, drawings in geometry don't ever think that that is uh, absolutely false but let not uh, 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 give time on that spend time on that uh, apollonius wrote compassion of the doca dodecahedron and icosahedron uh, he did it in a geometric fashion but the platonic solids he dealt with had some animated stories or animated concepts like plato assigned the tetrahedron with its sharp points and edges the tetrahedron you can see here to the element fire the cube with four squares uh, regularity to earth because people thought that earth is regular we can understand what earth is but even in plato's time the geography of the earth was not understood there were several stories and uh, stories uh, rich with uh, unearthly concepts but anyway they they thought it uh, some form was uh, octahedron to uh, air, air and water and uh, like that and plato uh, uh, assigned to the heaven the polyhedra the dodecahedron uh, to the heavens with 12 constellation now see we really have 12 constellations with which we uh, make the counting of the year very tidy but it is not necessarily that we actually have uh, 12 uh, only 12 constellations uh, around the ecliptic uh, there is one more constellation called the ophiuchus which you don't take into account so you might say standing at uh, this hour of civilization that the plato was wrong but you have to consider when to what time period plato belonged the plato systematic development of the theory of the universe was based on the five regular polyhedra these became to be known as platonic solids now platonic solids were dealt with full regard to with full regard to uh, plato and so plato had a role to play the search for pi is not for us to decide now it has a different history altogether we will come to coordinate geometry the cart when the cart he made one of the greatest advances in geometry by connecting algebra and geometry now algebra ha had a very strong hold on our minds especially on on the minds of the intellectuals and in order to pay their debt many here uh, historian write in this way that in order to pay their debt to uh, algebra they always connected the recent branch of expertise or recent branch of study to algebra and in fact algebra made things may uh, uh, pretty simple uh, and so rene descartes made one of the greatest advances he connected algebra with geometry and now here is a myth if you are talking of history myths will crop up and you cannot just shove that aside a myth is that he was watching a fly on the ceiling when he conceived of locating points on a plane with a pair of numbers this might help you to remember even a school if a school kid is listening to this presentation or this uh, lecture uh, maybe maybe this is something to do with the fact that he stayed in bed every day until 11 am uh, not very unheard of thing in these times when our sleeping hours actually start at 3 am or 4 am in the night or wee hours of the morning now apart from rene descartes one fellow who do it, did it very independently was farma now farma was a, a statesman he had several responsibilities to discharge and he was a what do you call a, an amateur mathematician but to what height can amateur study rise was shown by farma and farma also discovered geometry but it's the what the version that we use today is the version of descartes you can find it in in the history of mathematics at several points of time like the, say 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 leibniz and newton uh, 
uh, arabing at the art of calculus but uh, not uh, i mean we use more, use more of leibniz less of newton uh, so that is the way it goes i mean two fellows uh, arabing it is again true of the special theory of relativity so in history you will see not one fellow but contemporary other fellows other men or women arriving at the same proof but history gives preference to one and the others uh, contribution is lost not really lost but he is not spoken about in in a way the other is spoken about now uh, here i want to bring uh, our uh, very beloved son of bengal ashutosh mukhopadhyay who in his later life uh, was a lawyer Uh, a judge and uh, educational administrator he was the vice chancellor uh, of the university of calcutta and but at the very prime of his life he was a mathematician he loved mathematics from the core of his heart and in fact he had tried to secure a position uh, with a salary that was equivalent to that of the european teachers but he failed we all know jagadish chandra bose prafulla chandra rai had to face the same obstacle they somehow lingered but ashutosh left the field but he was uh, taken under his wings by mohandalal chakkar and mohandalal chakkar uh, who had set up the cultivation of science the indian association for the cultivation of science which is the first institute uh, for uh, research in the country uh that was set up in 1876 uh mandalal sharka loved uh, ashutosh who lost his father ashutosh lost his father at a very young age and ashutosh uh, used to teach at indian association for the cultivation of science and as a mathematician uh, he uh, is an outstanding fellow and uh, from his book we, we can quote this that analysis is the science of number geometry is the science of space okay done but can't we uh, connect space and number yes that has been done by descartes and that is the analysis space is homogeneous every homogeneous substance can by the choice of a unit be represented by a number and that way you can go into analytical geometry which uh, rene descartes the great french mathematician had given us now also they should find french mathematicians coming up in large numbers against british mathematicians at that particular uh, point of time and the french contribution is really really great this is why satyendranath bose spent a lot of his time studying the contribution of french scientists and especially french mathematicians uh, and this has been told by uh, his biographers and of course the french uh, did a lot for geometry now in every system he said ashutosh said that in every system uh we must have an origin which is as it were a symbol of reference in every natural system there can be one relation like a curve can have different uh relations with, with one another but it have only one equation so that is the way analytical geometry or analytic geometry progresses ashutosh gave a very concise definition of that or like a very concise explanation of that now euclid uh, somehow uh, had uh, failed in his fifth postulate and he was not very happy with his fifth postulate so non euclidean geometries had to had to crop up and non euclidean geometries were held by uh, handled by uh, a few people of whom uh, among whom bolia and lovachevsky now this spelling lovachevsky is not always correct even our uh, great uh, scientists of these days they uh, use a different spelling lovachevsky lovachevsky was of course russian he did a lot for the russian uh, not only for russian science russian engineering as well but he was forgotten after a point of time levachevsky was not given his due now janes boloya he also contributed to non euclidean geometry but the fellow who is called the prince of mathematics carl friedrich gauss actually enabled them to proceed further Janos Bolya and Nikolai Lewachevsky these are all 18th 19th century uh, mathematicians gauss almost uh, worked at the same point of time and he used uh, i mean 
he used uh, the statements of gauss studied uh, the his elements but made some uh, changes that would dislodge euclid from his throne just as einstein had dislodged newton from his throne gaussian geometry is the study of curves and surfaces in three dimensional euclidean space these were of course in, in, uh, enriched by bolyai and uh, lewachevsky and what we get from them again as we said what we are focusing on is a huge portion of history which can be put down in black and white but that will occupy several shelves of a library we are just trying to take you through the garden of geometry giving you some glimpses a little better than a bird's eye view and uh, in this course we come to again the parallel postulate now if the parallel postulate is replaced by given a line and no point not on it no lines parallel to the given line can be drawn we are moderating the playfair axiom we get elliptic geometry which is general term you can also call it spherical if there are several such lines through a point not on it this is hyperbolic geometry now the essential difference between euclidean and these non two uh, geometries lies in the nature of parallel lines as we have already pointed out in hyperbolic geometry there are at least two distinct lines that pass through the point and a parallel but you can think of uh, such uh, lines in uh, uh, on a plane surface in euclidean geometry not possible but our nature our habits are used to euclidean geometry and that is why we still take euclidean geometry to be too true and the uh, other geometries to be awkward agree but our, our earth the curved surface of our earth is awkward in that sense the sum of the angles of a triangle is greater than 180 degree now what is, what is a triangle on a spherical surface in fact there are two great circles cutting the equator that can be said to be a triangle in in that uh, area you see the angles uh, formed here at the cross section uh, uh, at the intersection point of uh, the great circles the longitude and the equator is more than 90 degree so here it is naturally more than 180 degree lines parallel at one place eventually cross now what are lines i mean lines should also have to be uh, defined here we take the great circles part of the great circles as lines if you extend it on both sides it would ultimately cross one another so there are no parallel lines on the spherical surface and here is a comparison of how the different type of geometries uh, play out uh, euclidean plane is like that zero curvature no curvature at all positive curvature is that of a sphere and negative curvature is that of hyperbolic geometry now uh, i have already taken up a lot of time i'm trying to conclude uh, uh, my presentation yeah uh, now you can take uh, 10 more minutes because uh, somehow we have started late okay sir okay thank you so much thank, thank you. now this is a western saddle that is very very uh, known to us and this is an ex uh, example of the hyperbolic uh, surface that we are talking of the negative curvature and these things come into play in physics as well when we try to understand the shape of the universe is it spherical if you if you if you say 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 uh, issue a signal of light from some point would it come back to us at a much much later uh, age much later point of time or would it vanish into uh, the unknown uh, regions of the universe what type of thing is this is it flat it is not flat so what what type of curvature does it have so these are the uh, questions that crop up in physics and in order to do that type of physics you have to depend on geometry and these are this is the geometry given to us by lewachevsky uh, janus bolyai now also without uh, this elliptic uh, or um, spherical geometry you cannot uh, trace out your path uh, or the path of shortest distance on the globe uh, 
that the airliners know very much because they, if they want to uh, reach from one place uh, of the earth to some other place in order to save fuel they must choose the shortest path and that is why uh, we might using uh, a flat map we might wonder why is a plane flying from vancouver to the philippines following a route that takes over japan and korea instead of flying a straight line over the pacific ocean i mean this is uh, this of course happens because you are projecting the uh, spherical surface on a flat surface so that is that is possible that wondering is possible why a flight from new york to europe has to travel almost uh, through greenland why well, yeah, does it happen now this i would skip but one one thing i again come back to blaise pascal he died at a very young age as i said uh, at uh, uh, 39 years of age only uh, and in fact uh, people say that uh, what doomed him to death was his uh, entanglement with his type of religion and uh, he put uh, more emphasis more focus uh, on religious uh, things uh, and that took away his time for doing more mathematics and he could have be become the greatest mathematician and in fact surpassing carl uh, friedrich gauss Uh, but that was not to be and uh, but he he had given us uh, something that we still use in engineering in might be a different fashion and one of the first applications of modern mathematics to emerge during the renaissance was the study of perspective for purposes of painting and architecture without that you cannot do proper architecture you are given a land which is peat land you have to do the construction on that you have to do uh, come up with wonderful structure that will impress the politicians the, but you don't have a geometry to go around these things so that that was uh, the necess that was the need so again necessity is the mother of invention and you can uh, map a plane surface s to another plane surface as jack by projection from a point o i haven't given the diagram here i should have given it the point p on uh, it maps on another plane but the angles get different obviously the distances and the angles uh, between lines are not preserved under a projective mapping and in fact you uh, might uh, recall that uh, i was speaking about gauss doing projective geometry in some manner and gauss can be uh, given the credit for modern map mapping map making as well uh, he, there also when he did some geodetic calculation there also he had to concern himself with how to project the surface, spherical surface on a plane surface uh, do a map like that now pascal's mystic hexagram everyone knows uh, this man he was trying to uh, what is it is he trying to do with these figures he is trying to uh, arrive at certain features of these figures if you just put it uh, put an ellipse here that would only make sense that only useful i mean mathematicians are not always trying to do useful things but they are interested in uh, curving out some some characteristic some feature that would be that would make sense now this is if we start with a b a b c d e f with this ellipse he arrived at a hexagram uh, which where the where the lines cut where the lines intersect are all on a straight line this can be uh, uh can be seen as not meaning much but later on it was uh, it was a uh, uh, used for um, useful application descriptive geometry was also uh, given uh, meaning by uh, jaspard monge and you have to link descriptive geometry with projective geometry now these were all all lieutenants of the napoleon the great emperor napoleon napoleon himself wanted to be a scientist that is biographers always tell us but he co couldn't become one but he was an emperor and he had the command to bring all this uh, gaspard monge was his uh, teacher and he has taken his uh, exam uh, during his uh, army years now monge also gave his name to a generic problem uh, this mp mkp and nobel prize was given to Uh, the later one for economics, of course. 
but descriptive geometry of monge uh, this projective geometry of blaise pascal enable someone of the napoleonic army called jean vector pancelet to come up with projective geometry he published it in 1822 just a one piece of history which is proven which that comes from uh, 1815 he uh, went with napoleon to occupy russia napoleon failed uh, he couldn't tackle uh, the russian uh, uh, intelligent uh, maneuvering military maneuvering he had to come back he had left his whole army to die somehow constant survived he was taken to prison he was uh, an officer they thought that interviewing an officer might give us some useful truth he was kept in a uh, uh, prison in saratov and in that prison on the walls of the prison he invented his projective geometry using his memory whatever he learned in his school days college days and with that saratov later on he got some papers and pen- pencils as well he brought back the saratov papers in 1822 he wrote uh, these things and uh, gaspar monje desargues with their uh, heritage projective geometry came into being Uh, through the application done by Poncelet. Now this is from uh, Men of Mathematics by E. T. Bell, which is a very famous book. Uh, that elementary approach to the geometry of Poncelet can be done in this way, like the two circles. This is of course school geometry. Two circles uh, intersecting each other. This is a common chord. Now if you try to pull apart, this becomes a common tangent. Then uh, if you pull apart again, this what does this become? This is not a tangent as well. I mean, not a ta- not even a tangent. What is this? This actually in, uh, is, is a perpendicular to the center joining uh, the two uh, perpendicular to the line uh, connecting the two centers. So this is an approach to elementary approach to the geometry of Poncelet. So that was projective geometry. That was essential. Differential geometry. Not much time to deal with. Again, uh, Gauss. Uh, is credited with this gaspard monge also contributed to this finally we have fractal geometry i i would not take much more than 5 minutes fractal geometry is the geometry of our times because fractal geometry though it originated in uh, uh, the 19th century but actually fractal geometry has been given the shape which is useful in present times in very recent times and one of the fellows who is uh, who again stands out as a tower in this field is mandelbrot and mandelbrot was working with ibm and one of mandelbrot's very benoit mandelbrot very famous uh, um, uh, quote is this clouds are not spheres mountains are not cones coast lines are not circles and bark is not smooth nor does lightning travel in a straight line so what we are doing trying to do is come as far come close to nature as far as possible so projective geometry also did that your differential geometry also did that fractal geometry is another way of coming close to nature coming close to the real picture without doing things in an ideal way without taking just simple ideal points ideal points are also there in projective geometry now in the whole of science the whole of mathematics smoothness was everything that is ideal what it did was, was to open a roughness for investigation think of a coastline if you if you you would see if you use a longer scale the coastline would be of lesser length than if you use a smaller uh, smaller scale because there you will find more curvatures so what when you will use a longer scale you are ignoring the kinks the curvatures and trying to come up with an ideal picture so even if you uh, are are measuring the boundaries of nations you are doing uh, making an error so fractal geometry tries here the classic mandelbrot below this is done everyone knows who uh, is familiar with computer programming this function zn1 is fz zn or if you prefer this one start with a uh, initial points anywhere on this on this uh, uh, cartesian plane start anywhere with uh, initial point z0 and if you go about putting 1 2 3 4 the points roam around the origin 
Now you can draw a picture, and this is an interesting uh, Mandelbrot picture done through a computer, and it can decay to zero, it can go ten to infinity, and this oscillation thing we are trying to measure. But more easy to understand is the fractal nature in pattern. See, this is this is repetitive. One getting divided into two branches. This again getting into two branches. This dividing into two branches. So it is repetition or for fractal you can you can call iteration. This repetition you can find in nature. This is very interesting. Again, uh, the cock curve that is very interesting. That is very known in fractal. Having a length one, you can break it up into three. Identical pieces of same length. Vanish this part, put it as a triangle, 60 degree uh, like that, and uh, put it as a triangle. But the base vanishes. Length is four by three. You go on doing that. You arrive at a picture by by uh, continuous iteration, which is not in any way familiar with your old length. This. That is why we said that if you are trying to do it in an ideal manner, the length that you get get here. See here, the length is much more than here, and how complex it is getting by each iteration. This is called iteration, one after the other, one after the other, doing the same thing. This is called iteration. Uh, this is called, in fact, uh, the dimension. Dimension here is not one d, one dimension like a line, two dimension like a plane, three dimension like a. Uh, So say a sphere or a, a cube, not like that. The dimension thing can be given by this. The fractal dimension is log of number of cells in a species. A species divided by it's a ratio divided by log of magnification factor. See, this is called the Sierpinski triangle. You can construct it at home. You can give it to your kids or your uh, uh, or your fellow fellow students. Uh, uh, draw a Sierpinski triangle. This is repetitive. You first take the midpoints of these three. Uh, this is an, uh, this is an, uh, all sides are equal. Uh, midpoints of these lines, connect them, draw, get a triangle. Again, do the same thing here. Midpoints of these lines, connect them, get a triangle. Do the same thing here. So this is repetitive. This is a wonderful uh, design, of course. You, you can you must appreciate that. And designs are they are following the fractal pattern in several uh, fashion show, shows these days also. But this. With this, uh, see, this can be put as three square. This can be put as two square. Log three by two, and it comes to be one point five eight. So that dimension of this Sierpinski triangle, which has been done through fractal patterns, is one point five eight. So that is what I tried to say. And these are the steps of geometry. These are the phases of geometry, uh, which we, uh, which are exciting to say the least. but which does not constitute the full story there are other stories as, as well as for example i was talking with uh, professor ghosh our chair person uh, and i was saying that only projective geometry can be dealt with uh, and that is that is a fascinating picture because not much space has been given in our courses uh, to projective geometry but this is a, what i thought should, could be presented and might might i am not sure whether it really did might impress uh, the viewers or the listener Anyway, that is what I have to say. Thank you for giving me the time. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Professor Bosch. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, really a wonderful talk. I just can tell you, and uh, I think all the participants will be very much enriched with your information and what you have provided. And uh, I now uh, request the organizers uh, if. Uh, there any question from the chat box in the google meet as well as in the um, youtube link then please place the questions to the speaker sir i want to ask something yes uh, mr costa please go ahead <laughs> yes sir uh, sir can you say little more about uh, the value of pi hmm Pardon, I didn't get your question. It was snapping. The link is snapping. Uh, can you the, say little more about the value of pi, sir? Yes, of course. I mean, uh, uh, see, uh, again, as I said, uh, that uh, mathematicians do not necessarily 
focus on doing things that are useful and there is a wonderful quote from uh, gh hardy who was the mentor of ramanujan uh, gh hardy didn't care about the application of mathematics and someone had said to him that sir uh, there is a wonderful application of your theorem and hardy you know very casual man said oh is, is there one uh, i am elated something like that and so uh, i mean mathematicians are not always thinking about what application their theorem might have but at the same time when when uh, you can see it in different versions of mathematics even even say 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 uh, gave gave his joseph crest of the peaker uh, in his book he also says that our mathematics had actually originated from our practice from our trying to apply uh, our uh, limited knowledge to to our fields of uh, work and there we faced several obstacles and there in fact this thing pi had come up and what we tried to do is make it more perfect so that our construction become more perfect and in every civilization there were see a, a mason doing some work he might have found uh, pi to be the value of pi to be so in some way insufficient or some uh, way erroneous for his work again some intellectual having a lot of leisure time a contemporary um, uh, intellectual a mathematician if you want to call him have found that yes pi has not reached its uh, value if you are asking about the people who were mostly contributed to pi that is a different story altogether in in, in say china you won't find uh, specific examples of people uh, correcting uh, the value of pi three with the integer part there is no problem but with the decimal part there has always been a problem and now we are calculating pi to more decimal places more than 5000 decimal places so we are trying to yes. make it more perfect so in many ways even in say space travel you will uh, find things which you need to perfect as far as or make it possible. that is why we need these things to be perfect but as i said what the vedic mathematicians did was uh, appreciable given their knowledge their tools and what the arabs did uh, what the greeks did of course all things are appreciable uh, considering at what age they did the work okay sir okay sir thank you sir thank you uh, any other questions devashish any other questions is there uh hello devashish no sir have you no, seen sir. have you seen any 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 question in the chat box no sir no uh, sir no questions from youtube chat anything box. in the youtube no sir no sir no question from youtube sir. okay then uh, dr dash uh, if you allow i just want to ask you one just a simple query uh, might be a layman perspective uh, thing is that uh, in your anticipation uh when this uh, two different fields algebra and geometry are merged or algebra is being used in geometry somewhere in between so what is the time or period uh, when it was actually initiated can you please tell me about this thing uh like uh, th this is again a, a very interesting question now descartes time uh, uh, if you allow me just just one uh, minute if, if i can go back to just descartes i don't take much time yeah of course please just uh, go back to uh, rene descartes yeah now i won't say that it was 1600 ad uh, or uh, in the 17th century that uh, the link between algebra and geometry really happened okay uh, it in fact might have happened much much earlier we must explore in more details um, the contribution of the arab civilization the islamic civilization if you want to call it more in a more general manner uh, that was uh, uh, a period where the greeks and later the romans had left or they were vanquished 
and the arabs took over because the romans did not add much to the greek knowledge that was only done by the uh, arabs so that way uh, it must have happened much before that my my uh, uh, guess informed guess says that it might have happened in uh, the 13th or 14th century as as, as see if if, if you go into uh, uh, projective geometry as well projective geometry the the main idea was created by desargus but desargus didn't get much uh, he he didn't come into line like he didn't get, get much uh, uh, credit for his work so this was in the making much earlier than descartes and uh, what ashutosh had said about descartes is quite okay because what our textbook says going by that rene descartes had done that but what i think is 13th and 14th century is more more uh, rich in this and must have uh, done something which is still need to discover because but without proof without uh, say like a cuneiform tablet that has helped us without some proof many proofs have uh, been uh, just destroyed by warring factions as we all know so my guess says that it should have started in the 13th or 14th century as uh, many things in that period hinted like that okay thank you very much uh, perhaps there is no more question from the audience part so let us thank the speaker again uh, dr manish prateep yeah yeah please. sir actually yeah sir one more request sir yes. actually i have doubt, uh, just i have seen a question in the chat box okay uh, please actually uh, and the question is how could we apply geometry in real world situation pardon professor uh, gharami yes sir how Repeat could we apply question. geometry in real world situation applying geometry in real world situation how can we apply yes. is that the question yes yes right yes so all through our discussion we uh, have been trying to arrive at that Uh, see this is a very interesting question because this question if it comes from say uh, a student in uh, bsc uh, one might think that why he or she is asking such a question because he is already into this he or she is already studying that but no see while studying history of science i have uh, realized that our cultural background decides how much we can think how much we can actually appreciate and see because euclidean geometry forms uh, uh forms the the uh, back backbone of our civilization in some way and it has uh, ruled the world of mathematics in uh, for more than 2000 years we still think geometry to be some ideal thing which is to be done with uh, pen and pencil on paper on a flat surface but this doesn't correspond to what we are seeing on the street on the field around us that is why spherical geometry came up that is why because we have to do it on a curved surface that is why uh, hyperbolic geometry came up projective geometry see as i have already said i will repeat that uh, in that uh, situation in the late uh, 18th early 19th century when there was need for military construction not much a civil constructions only people connected with the emperors enjoying uh, the blessings of the emperor only had uh, the liberty and the finance to construct a house of their own uh, in, in, uh, as per their own choice but military constructions and state constructions were very very uh, essential and for that they had to discover something and that something was projective geometry without which you cannot really uh, build different floors in different manner different designs so that is why geometry has slowly matured and the fractal geometry that we uh, discussed about in the concluding part is one such geometry that takes us closer to the real world and makes it applicable Uh, to the uh, realities that we are concerned with so that is my answer all through our discussion 
from the Euclidean planar geometry, we have uh, gone on, proceeded to the ages, to the geometries which take us closer to reality. That is uh, my answer, Professor Karam. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very sir. Thank much you. for wonderful. I, I think Hello, it's, sir. Time, it's time Hello, for. Sir. Yeah. Oh, it's, Professor sorry, sorry, to sorry, 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 sorry. You have a question? Yeah, please. Uh, sir, how to develop the relation that ratio perimeter and diameter is pi of the circle? I think I think this is uh, uh, this question is a uh, a bit elementary. I think this can be taken up in a different uh, session. I think. Yeah, Thanks I for your question, uh, Mr. Rajvari Bera. But I think you know the Thank answer. You. I mean, it's it's not, not very difficult. But since uh, there is a uh, time crunch and the uh, okay, okay. next speaker is waiting, uh, so and okay, uh, Professor Ghosh is also <laughs> in, a, in a difficult okay. position with. Okay, okay. So thank you, Dr. Dash, for your very wonderful speech. I think all were actually benefited and got some information regarding the geometry. And you covered, of course, a very vast area. I can see that started from the very ancient and uh, how the geometry was actually developed. Up. Starting from that particular age, you have covered the final latest issue of the geometry advancement also, like fractal geometry and projective geometry also. So thank you very much for your very wonderful speech. Thank you, sir. Thanks to the college, to the organizing committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Organizers, can we move to the next speaker? Yes, sir. Yes, you may move, sir. And uh, Professor Arinna Patacharya is present. So, welcome, Professor. Yeah, well. Thank you, Boshi. Uh, welcome, okay. sir. So, oh. It's my pleasure to introduce now Professor Patacharya. Uh, Professor Arinna Patacharya did his uh, MSc, MPhil, and PhD from Department of Mathematics, University of Calcutta. He has uh, more than 100 research publications in different international and national reputed peer-reviewed journals. And already 15 research scholars <clears throat> got award uh, in PhD degree. And presently, eight are doing research under his supervision. And his area of research are differential geometry, Ricci flow, and computational geometry also. He visited uh, different uh, places like France, Italy, Romania, Japan, Vietnam, and China for participating and delivering invited talks in various universities and institutes. And apart from that, uh, let me tell you, he is currently the secretary, honorable secretary of a very old 112 years old heritage academic society like Calcutta Mathematical Society. And today he will be delivering his talk on differentiable manifolds and applications. So it's my proud privilege to introduce him and I request Professor Bhattacharya to start his talk. Thank you, please. Thank you, Koshik. And uh, Koshik is my like a brother and he's also treasurer of Calcutta Mathematical Society. And uh, I also thank to principal of uh, Belda College and the organizing team, uh, especially Basudev and uh, Prabir for giving me chance to deliver or share some, uh, some of our work in this field. So now I present uh, just for one minute. I'm showing the uh, presentation. Yes, it has come. Yeah. Okay. Ha. Huh. So <clears throat> the title is uh, differentiable manifolds and applications. Okay. Now I'll start uh, from the last question asked uh, to Dr. Manoj Pratim that how we can apply geometry in our real fields. So that can be included in this area that differentiable manifolds folds and applications. First of all, I should start with what is a manifold. Now, manifold is a topological space. Okay, it is a topological space which has no geometric concepts. 
So if you want to give some geometric concepts, that is the definition of curve or definition of surface or the curvature or the torsion, all these things, the geometric concepts, we must have some extra structure on this topological space. So for that one, we need a differentiable structure with that topological space. So now, so what is a topological manifold? Now the topological manifold is a topological space where each point of it has a neighbor root homeomorphic to an open subset of Rn. So why we need this one? Because we want to introduce calculus on this topological space. So if you don't have the concept of derivative or uh, the integrations or other things. So that's why we need some correspondence between the topological space to the Rn. So M is locally Euclidean of dimension N. And these two concepts, M is a Hausdorff space and M is second countable, it is extra condition to get a metric on this manifold. So I'll come it for this one later that why we need a housetop space and M is second countable. But at first, when we are doing with the topological manifold, we don't require the first two conditions that M is housetop space and M is second countable. Just it is a homeomorphism is required from the topological space to an Rn. Now this, the open neighborhood, what we are choosing is if I denote this one by u and the homeomorphism phi, we call this pair u and phi as a chart, as a chart of, of a point. Suppose we take a point on this M and u is a open neighborhood of that point and phi is the homeomorphism, then this u phi is called a chart. Now in geography, we know that what is the utility of chart? You know that to make more understandable uh, about some area, we need the chart. So that is the important thing here that u and phi is called a chart here and uh, the homeomorphism is the phi and if the phi p that means it is an element of rn so it has x1 p x2 p xn p so this gives you the coordinate system you know that how we get the coordinate system in r2 also there is x axis and y axis Actually, it is a R cross R. If you take the uh, graph x axis and y axis, and then you take a point x and y as coordinate, then actually it is uh, the <coughs> that coordinate is a member of R2. So here also this x1 p, x2 p, x1 p gives us the coordinate of the point p. Okay. So this is called local coordinates for P. This for P, it is the local coordinate. And the chart is centered at P, okay? Now I am starting from the very basic thing because uh, there are, I, uh, Probin has told me that uh, there may be some PG and UG students. So if, uh, those who are in advanced level, please just recap these things. Okay. Now, this is some um, topological properties of the manifolds. I'm not going to this uh, now. Now, this is the case where this is the, uh, this picture, this is the manifold or the topological space and U R V are the neighborhoods. And if there is an overlapping part, this is the overlapping part, 
and phi is a homeomorphism and here psi is another homeomorphism. So phi u and psi v are the subsets of Rn. These are the subsets of Rn. So psi compose phi inverse and phi compose psi inverse are the mapping from Rn to Rn. So these are the two maps which are uh, the mappings from Rn to Rn. Now we want that these things will be smooth. This phi compose psi inverse and psi compose phi inverse should be smooth. Otherwise, we can't do calculus in this topological space. So that's why we take that M be a topological manifold and U phi and V psi are two charts such that U intersection B is non null. Then the composition map psi compose phi inverse. These are the transition map from phi to psi and also the reverse one, the phi compose psi inverse. This should be, this should be C infinity map. C infinity map means a smooth map. That means all the, yeah, here we have driven that smooth C infinity is if for the all component functions as continuous partial derivatives of all order. It has the components function has continuous partial derivatives of all order. And if in addition f is bijective and f and f inverse are smooth, then they are called diffeomorphism. Okay. So now to, to get the differentiable structure of this manifold, we need that if u and v and like some other other sub uh, open subsets cover m m is the topological space and if we consider u phi v psi and like this the collection and if the all phi and psi and all other homeomorphisms are this type of transition maps are c infinity then and the smooth atlas, this is called atlas, the collection is called atlas and the smooth atlas is maximal that there is no other chart is there which is separate from them. That means if there is another chart like u and uh, u phi and v psi uh, like some other thing w and some other thing, then it should contain in that collection it should contain in that collection then we call that it is a maximal collection and this maximal collection if this maximal collection is there then we call that m with that maximal collection is a differentiable structure okay so and it is called the smooth manifold now what is the meaning of atlas I think you know in geography, we generally read a book uh, or have a book like Atlas. Atlas means it is a collection of all charts, all smooth charts. In our cases, it is the collection of all smooth charts. So, so to the topological space with this Atlas, smooth Atlas is called a smooth manifold or differentiable manifold, okay? Now, these are the some examples of smooth manifolds. So discrete space, the discrete topological space is a zero dimensional smooth manifold. The Euclidean space Rn itself is a n dimensional manifold. The unit circle, see this one, the unit circle S1, which is related by this equation, x square plus y square equal to 1, is a differentiable manifold of dimension 1. That's why you have given here S1, S1, though it is a member of R2, but they are related with this equation and we can have a map phi i, see this one, the phi is R. Here the phi i's are the mapping from u1 to r. The dimension of r is 1. 
So that's why it is a manifold, a differentiable manifold of dimension 1, S1. Any curve, any curve is a differentiable manifold of dimension 1. Now, how will you, for the lemons, how you, you can uh, consider the dimension that how many parameter requires to express this one? You can express this one as x equals to cos t, y equal to sin t. So that means only one parameter, only one parameter is required to express this unit circle. So it is a manifold, a differentiable manifold of dimension one. Suppose sphere, what is sphere? Sphere, the equation is written as x squared plus y squared plus z squared equal to one. Suppose a unit sphere of radius one, but we denote this one as S2, not as S3. It is denoted by S2. Why? Because we can give a stereographic projection from this. I have not included the example here. You can see any book of uh, differentiable manifolds that the example is given that we can give a stereographic projection from the open uh, neighborhood to R2. We can give a projection from the open neighborhood to R2. So sphere or any surface, any surface are the differentiable manifolds of dimension two. Okay, so it is given, sphere is given as S2, not as S3. But if we consider is in fourth dimension, where x, y, z, and t is there, the time variable is there, then we can take as S3 because we can consider art, art as a uh, three dimensional manifold as S3 because there are x, y, z, and t. Time is the variable there. Okay. So sphere, cylinder, cone, all these things are all the, that means the surfaces are the two-dimensional differentiable manifolds because there are smooth structures are there. See here, the example is given. We can consider U1, U2, U3, U4 as the open neighborhoods of the points and the homeomorphisms are this. And we can consider this one, the homeomorphisms. And this Ui and phi i is an atlas on S1. And obviously, it is a maximal. And we can consider the phi i compose phi j inverse are also smooth in these cases. So it is a differentiable manifold. Now, we need some extra thing on this differentiable manifolds. Uh, we, were, we may have to uh, consider M as a manifold and N is a, another manifold of dimensions of different type and we may uh, want to go from this M to N or N to M. So we have to give a smooth maps between manifolds. This is a very important concept, the smooth maps between the manifolds. So when there will be two manifolds, M and N, of different dimension. Suppose A is a n-dimensional manifold and N is an m-dimensional manifold, then F is a smooth map. That means we can go from M to N. If there exists a smooth chart U phi containing P and V shy containing FP such that FU is a subset of V and the composite map psi compose F compose phi inverse is a smooth from phi u to psi v. That means this is a mapping from Rn to Rm. So we need the calculus on Rn. See this one, this map psi compose f compose phi inverse is a mapping from Rn to Rm. Okay. So, so this is the smooth map definition of smooth map. So this should be smooth. 
Now every smooth map is continuous. There's some properties. Uh, every constant map uh, is smooth. Identity map is smooth. These are the properties of smooth map. We can prove also, but I'm not going to the proofs of these things. Now diffeomorphism, I have told it that if M and N are smooth manifolds, a diffeomorphism from M to N is a smooth bijective map F M to N that has a smooth inverse also. Smooth inverse, that means F and F inverse are also C infinity map. They are also C infinity map. And M and N are diffeomorphic. Now there are some properties uh, that every composition of diffeomorphism is a diffeomorphism. Uh, every finite product of diffeomorphisms between smooth manifolds is a diffeomorphism. Now every diffeomorphism is a homeomorphism, but the converse is not true. That is important example is given. So suppose f is r two r defined by f t equals to this one, t to the power two n minus one. Then obviously f is a homeomorphism, but the inverse f inverse does not has a derivative at zero. Hence f inverse is not smooth. Hence f is not a diffeomorphism. Now after defining this one, we shall define a curve on this differentiable manifold. So what is a curve on differentiable manifold? The concept is just generalization of what we uh, define in our uh, one dimension and two dimension. So a differentiable curve or parametrized curve is a manifold in a manifold M is a smooth map from I to M where I is an interval of real numbers such that there is a C infinity extension to an open interval. So if that sigma is a mapping from AB to M is a C infinity curve and sigma A is the initial point and sigma B is the end point. Okay. And if sigma A equal to sigma B, then the curve is called a closed curve. And uh, we may generalize this one for the closed curve. Uh, we can generalize this one from minus epsilon to epsilon to M. Uh, and two curves are said to be equivalent at a point if their initial points is P and the derivative are same. Now, what is the concept of tangent space? Now we need uh, the concept of tangent space here. So let M in an n-dimensional smooth manifold. So there is a curve is here. And we have just seen that uh, they are equivalent if these two derivatives at the initial points are equal. Now, each of the equivalence classes is called the tangent vector at P. Okay. And denoted by xp. So we denote this one as a xp, the tangent vector. The same concept what we have done in our uh, class 11 and 12. So we have a curve and we take the uh, derivative of a curve at that point and that is the uh, slope of the tangent. We know that that is the uh, slope of the tangent at that point. So and this is a tangent vector. Or the velocity vector, we can also sometimes call it as a velocity vector uh, at that point. Now, the set of all tangent vectors at the point P is called the tangent space of M at P. So now at that point P, there may be some other tangent vectors. So the collection of all tangent vectors is denoted by TPM. And the union of all such TPM, the union of all such TPM is denoted by TM and it is called tangent bundle. It is called tangent bundle. Now there are some properties of this TPM uh, and the tangent vector. Uh, now X, that means X is a uh, mapping. Now what it uh, gives us now if we take xp it gives you some real quantity okay xp is a mapping from tpm to r actually it is a so 
it gives you the member of r the real number when you get the tangent vector and if you calculate the tangent vector at some point it gives a real number so xf belongs to r and this is linearity property xa plus beta g gives a linearity condition and this is the leibniz product rule product rule you know that x of fg if there are two functions f and g then xf and gp plus fp and xg this is the leibniz product rule Now this df has the expression like this. Uh, if f one, f two, f m are the components of uh, this c infinity p, and if y one to m be a smooth function, then we can get the df as the. Uh, this is the expression for df, and this is also important thing that df. Uh, df of x actually gives you the xcpf and it gives a real number at last it gives a real number now another concept is a vector field what is the concept of vector field the vector field actually gives you a correspondence between the point on the manifold and a tangent vector okay so it is a one type of mapping which is assignment it is an assignment to a point with a tangent vector xp at each point p of m so this assignment gives you a real valued function okay it gives a real valued function and this is called a vector field and it is also this for the vector fields uh, the set of all vector fields is denoted by chi m the set of all vector fields denoted by chi m now this is the properties are there now the lie bracket or lie derivative of the function f is denoted by lx f and the lie bracket is also another vector field lie bracket is also denoted by or sometimes called poisson bracket now lie bracket actually gives you the two vector fields are there x and y and there is a lie transformation lie transformation gives you another another vector field like it is denoted by xy the lie bracket xy f as xp of y f minus yp of x f that means it gives a a torsion like a torsion like concept i will come it afterwards that from here we can get the uh, from this lie bracket we get the concept of torsion also afterwards so you are moving from one vector field to another vector field by a lie transformation and you are getting a skewed type motion here and this is xy of p of f is xpyf minus yp x yp of x f so if you this uh, omit this p and f we can denote by x y as x y minus y x generally we use this this one is used much more that lie bracket of x y f is x of y f minus y of x f okay now these are the properties of lie bracket very interesting properties which are very much useful that uh, the linearity holds and x y and y x are skew symmetric and the same if there is same thing, it is obviously zero and uh, this is a uh, if there is functions f and g are the functions and x y are the vector fields then this relation holds this is very important one and this jacobi identity is also important okay and if somewhere x p equals to 0 then p is called a singular point of x so i am just giving the concepts of uh, to go further to go in the research field 
these concepts are very much uh, useful. That's why I am uh, telling these definitions or the properties here. Now, this is another very important concept on the differentiable manifold that is one parameter group of transformation. Now, this one is very useful in, uh, uh, in the field of mathematical physics, in your biomathematics, everywhere, in fluid mechanics, this one parameter group of transformation is very important because here we take a mapping from R cross M to M. So this R, this R is important and this gives you the concept of time. You can take as a time here, okay? So then it will be R plus, and then it gives you the concept of physics and in the applied science. So let a mapping phi R cross M to M denoted by phi TP as a this way, phi, in the sub, uh, phi TP be such that uh, it is a diffeomorphism from M to itself. Okay, and phi s phi tp is equal to phi of s plus tp. That means it gives a motion. So it gives a flow. Here, the concept of flow is here. So the family phi t is called a one parameter group of transformations. So with these operations, it gives a group also. It forms a group. And it is a one parameter because R is their one parameter. If you consider R cross R cross M, then it is a two parameter group of transformations. Now, phi zero P is the initial point P. And if we consider phi S phi zero P, this is phi S P. So phi zero is the identity transformation. And the inverse one is this one phi of minus T P because it gives you the phi zero. So it forms a group and this psi t, if I consider the society is a differentiable cardboard M and it is called orbit through P. So it gives a motion on the differentiable manifold. Okay. And the tangent vector and the tangent vector XP that is DDT of F of psi t is, it is called generator of phi. It is the generator of phi. Okay. So this is an example uh, given that if phi is this one and phi tp is given this one is a one parameter group of transformation, then generator is this one. This is the generator. Now there is a concept of local one parameter group of transformations. Why we require this local one parameter group of transformations? I'm coming to that. But if we replace this R by I epsilon, which is from minus epsilon to epsilon, if we consider this an open interval and the same thing, the same definition, then we call it is a local one parameter group of transformation. Okay. So just if we replace R by some small open interval or minus epsilon to epsilon, then we call it as a local one parameter group of transformation. Now, why we need this one? Because if X is a vector field on a differentiable manifold, then X generates a local one parameter group, trans group of transformations in a neighborhood of a point of P of M. So it is a theorem. This is an interesting theorem. The proof is very large. I'm not giving the proof here. So we can prove that if X is a vector field, we can get a local one parameter group of transformations, but we may not have a global one parameter group of transformations. Okay. So when we will have a global one parameter group of transformation, when? So if a vector field have a global one parameter group of transformations, then we call the vector field is a complete. And it, it can only happen if every vector field are a compact manifold. If the manifold is compact, that means topologically compact. Okay, you know the compactness, definition of compactness that every open neighborhood has, uh, every open cover has <coughs> subcover finite subcover. So 
so the, for that compact manifold every vector field is complete this is also another important theorem so these are the two theorem but here the concept is this one that x always generates a local one parameter group of transformations but it doesn't give you a global one parameter group of transformation if the manifold is compact then you can get a global one parameter group of transformation now this is another concept of one form this is the so if you take tpm as a vector space we can we can prove that is a vector space by the operations then the you know that the vector space has a dual space so the dual space of tpm is uh, t star pm it is denoted by t star pm and the members of t star pm are the one forms so a mapping uh, from chi m to fm which satisfies the following conditions is called the one form okay and they are called covectors is covectors or linear functionals and for r form they are the, the r forms if there is a, a mapping from chi m cross chi m to chi m r times to fm okay fm is the set of all differentiable functions of the manifold so this is a mapping so it is r times and omega is r linear so this linearity condition is there and the definition is given like this omega of x1 x2 xr is equals to 1 by r factorial sigma sigma omega of this one the permutation is there okay and it is for even permutation it is plus 1 and for odd permutation permutation it is minus 1 now if i give this uh, i think you can understand this definition here better now it is the definition of another one wedge product the wedge product of two forms or if omega is r form and mu is s form it is defined in this way this sigma sigma of this so you can just see there here omega wedge mu if omega is a one form and mu are the another one form then omega wedge mu it will act on two vector fields x1 and x2 because omega is a one form it will act on omega x1 and mu is another one so it will act on another vector field so omega wedge mu will act on two vector fields and so it will be r plus s factorial so it is 1 by 2 factorial that means it is 2 and this one is the permutation omega x1 mu x2 so it is even permutation 1 2 and when it is 2 1 it will be minus when it will be 2 1 it is a minus so this is a sigma sigma it gives you plus and minus plus and minus for the even and odd permutations so these are the properties of wedge product i am not going to the details and this this uh, is a very important result which is uh, very much applied afterwards that if omega is a one form then d omega d omega is the differential of this omega it becomes a two form and so it will act on x1 and x2 and the result is like this half of x1 it, if you apply like this one you will get half of x1 omega x2 minus x2 of omega x1 minus omega of Lie bracket x1 x2 okay so this result will be applied afterwards now the another concept it's a very important concept i have to go a little uh, little fast because uh, there are many things to build uh, a linear connection linear connection you know the concept of linear connection from your childhood uh, but we don't uh, see it uh, properly now suppose there is a curve and if you take a tangent vector at some point and another point is there in the neighboring point q is another point then there is a uh, connection h is there f of x plus h minus fx 
by h you do generally for limit h tends to 0 for the derivative f dash x is limit h tends to 0 f of x plus h minus f x by h. Now that h, what is that h? h is the actually connection between the tangent vector at the p and the tangent vector at the q and that h is the linear connection h is the linear connection between the tangent vectors and it is actually the derivative the component of the tangent vector along the vector at q so del xy denoted by del xy okay is the covariant derivative which generally called as a covariant derivative of y along x covariant derivative of y along x just you remember the concept of h h is the horizontal component of the tangent vector along the tangent vector at q so that is the h del x y is the h and this is linear it is linear okay this concept is given by cos joule a french french mathematician he was alive uh, last uh, last year also i think uh, so del x y plus z equals to del x y plus del x z uh, del y plus z x del y x plus z. so the linearity is there and f del f x y f of del x y f is the mapping of f m and del x f y x f y plus f of del x y so these four conditions will uh, is the main con condition for the uh, definite uh, linear connection. So del xy is called the covariant derivative of y in the direction of x. Now if p is a tensor type 0s, that means it is a, if it is a covariant tensor of type uh, 0s or uh, rank s, okay, then del xp of y1, y2, ys because it will the p will act on the vector fields y on y to a y s it will give you x p of y on y to y s minus the summation i equal to 1 to s in this way it will the del will go inside one by one at first it will be del x y one then in the next term it will be minus of then p of y one del x y two and other things like this it will go like that one now the important is that what is the local local coordinate uh, local expression of this linear connection because in mathematical physics and in fluid mechanics or in solid mechanics we need the local representation we need the local representations of this derivative so this del del xj del del xi now these are the basis vector these are the basis vector of TPM. Okay. This is gamma Kij del del xk. Now, gamma Kij is also the member of Fm. And this is called the connection coefficients or the components of the connection. Don't misunderstand that it is a Christopher symbol now because for differentiable manifold, these are not Christopher symbols. For differentiable manifolds, these are not Christopher symbols. These are just the connection coefficients or the components of connection. If it is a Riemannian or semi-Riemannian manifold, then only if there is a concept of metric is there. If there is a concept of metric, I will come with later that if there is a concept of metric is there, then this becomes this gamma k i j becomes the Christopher symbols. We can show that these are the Christopher symbols of second kind. So I will come it afterwards. So these are the local representation uh, of uh, this del x y. It is for the basis vector, and this is for the general vectors. This is the expression. So we can utilize this one in our applied fields. The del x y is actually nothing but this one, and this x can be expressed as j i i del del x i and eta j del del x j because these are the components of x and these are the basis vector okay so we know that every element of a 
vector space can be expressed as a linear combination of its basis vectors. So this x can be expressed in this form. Now there is another two concepts, a very important concept, torsion tensor field and curvature tensor field. Because in our topological space, we have no concept of curvature and torsion or no concept of curve and all the things. So we are trying to introduce this curvature and torsion on these manifolds, okay, on differentiable manifolds. So torsion is nothing but a, another another vector field or tensor field. You can say it is tensor field because it is a mapping from chi m to chi m to chi m. Okay, dxy is del xy minus del yx minus xy. See again here the torsion. What is the thing here that you are going y along x and then x along y with a Lie bracket xy. That means with a motion, you are getting a skewness. You are getting a skewness on the manifold and you are getting the torsion tensor field. Okay, It is a tensor field of type 1, 2. That means contravariant part 1 and covariant part 2. And it is called symmetric if Txy is 0. That means if Lie bracket xy is del xy minus del yx. So a differentiable manifold is symmetric if its torsion is 0. Now these are the properties. It is skew-symmetric. Now what is the curvature tensor? Curvature tensor is a mapping from chi m cross chi m cross chi m to chi m. It is another 1, 3 tensor field. It is another 1, 3 tensor field and it gives a second order, second order derivative on the vector fields. You know from your basic BSC class that curvature, how you get the curvature? You know it is the d2y dx2 by 1 plus dy dx whole square whole to the power 3 by 2. You can find the curvature of a curve. Okay. So there is a concept of second order derivative. You can't get it from the first order derivative just. Uh, <clears throat> so the curvature is coming from this one, the second order derivative del x del y z minus del y del x z minus del z of Lie bracket x y. Now these are the properties of curvature tensor r x x y equal to 0. It can be proved. Okay. R x y z minus R y x z. That means it is skew symmetric for the first two terms. It is skew symmetric. And this if f is here, f will come outside. Now we come to the concept of Riemannian metric and the Riemannian connection. Now to get this Riemannian metric, we need the concept of Hausdorffness and second countable because there is a important theorem that every differentiable manifold has a partition of unity if the differentiable manifold is housed off and second countable. Now this partition of unity implies the existence of this Riemannian metric. You can't get this Riemannian metric if it is not housed off and second countable. So we need the concept of housed offness and second countability to get the partition of unity. And from that partition of unity, you can get the concept of this G. So this G is actually covariant tensor field. It is a chi m cross chi m to f m, which satisfies these conditions. The metric g x x greater than 0, the positive definiteness, g x x equal to 0. So if and only if x is the null vector for non-singularity and the symmetricness. So if these three conditions hold, then g is called a Riemannian metric. And if you omit this positiveness, then it is called a pseudo-Riemannian metric. 
and the differentiable manifold with this Riemannian metric is called a Riemannian manifold. Okay, so differentiable manifold with this Riemannian metric is called Riemannian manifold. And in local form, in local form, if the basis vectors we denote by gij, I am going fast now. Now, it is called a metric connection. This linear connection is called metric connection. If del g equal to 0, that means del x g y z equal to 0. And it is, so it gives a concept of parallelism on the Riemannian manifold. Because del x g equal to y z equals to 0 gives the concept of parallelism in the Riemannian manifold. And the vanishing torsion, that means the symmetric. So in the Riemannian manifold, for the Riemannian connection, it is also symmetric because the torsion is 0. Del xy minus del y x equal to Lie bracket xy. And every Riemannian manifold admits a unique Riemannian connection. It is a very large theorem and it is the fundamental theorem of Riemannian geometry that every Riemannian manifold admits a unique, a unique Riemannian connection. That means there exists only one and one connection which satisfies these two conditions that del 0 and its torsion is also 0. Now these are the properties of uh, some uh, Riemannian metric and Riemannian connection that Rxyz plus Ryz plus Rzxy 0. This is Bianchi's first identity, Bianchi's second identity with the derivatives. Okay. And this is the uh, the property for the uh, second, uh, for the last two pairs, it is skew symmetric. And for the pair xy, zu, zu, xy, for it is actually symmetric. Now, this is the uh, zero four. You can consider this one as a first kind of uh, tensor, even curvature tensor, if it is tapping from chi m cross chi m. Uh, from uh, chi m cross chi m to f m. The same thing, just it is uh, uh, another form of the definition. And I am com coming to the gradient vector field. I am omitting these things. And this is one is important. Einstein manifold. Now, if you want it to end with an orthonormal basis of TPM, then ASXPYP is actually, if we just take EIP and EIP and the sum, that means if we contraction, make the contraction with the first and fourth index of the previous definition here in this concept, in this concept, then we can get the concept of Ricci curvature. It is a Ricci curvature denoted by SXY or some term RICXY. Okay, it is Ricci curvature, and if this this one uh, S X Y equals to lambda of G X Y, then M is called an Einstein manifold, where is the lambda is a smooth function. Okay, and it uh, it can be proved that it becomes a constant for n equal to two, and this one is called the scalar curvature if we again contract with respect to E I and E I. If we consider this one, it is called the scalar curvature, okay. S E I E I. If M is a three-dimensional Einstein manifold, then M is a manifold of constant curvature. Okay, so this is a result. Now this is a concept of semi-symmetric metric connection. Now semi-symmetric metric connection is very much used in the uh, geological field because it is the uh, we can measure the uh, thing on the earth surface, the movement on the earth surface on this semi-symmetric with the semi-symmetric metric connection. And it is if the torsion tensor can be expressed as omega y x minus omega x y, where omega is a one form we called uh, it is a semi-symmetric connection. And with with this one, if del g is zero, we call this semi-symmetric metric connection. Now this is the concept of uh, well conformal curvature tensor. Uh, how much time I have? 
Can you hear me? Yes, uh, you can take uh, around uh, 12 minutes. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> well conformal curvature tensor is there. The concept of uh, conformal, there is a conformal mapping and the curvature tensor will change according to this rule. And it is called conformally flat if C, X, Y, Z is zero. I'm omitting this one. There are some results of uh, conformally flat manifold, conformally flat manifold, the uh, expression of the curvature tensor is there. And a car is called a geodesic on M with a linear connection if del x x equal to zero. That means the covariant derivative of x along x is equal to zero. That means it's a parallel vector field. And x is the vector tangent to the integral curve sigma at xt. So this gives a con concept of parallel vector field, and the, the curves are called for the parallel vector fields as geodesic. I'm omitting this one. Now, uh, this is the almost complex structure. Now, actually, the Riemannian manifold, suppose the Riemannian manifold of dimension n then we can divide that dimension into two parts. One is even dimension, another one is odd dimension. Now, even dimensional manifolds gives you the co concept of almost complex and complex manifold and Kylar manifold, Hermite manifold, all these things. And odd dimensional manifolds that gives you the concept of uh, contact manifolds and the Sasakian manifolds, uh, Ken Bonsu manifolds, all these things. So these are coming to the research part. So just I'm uh, going through the definitions that almost complex manifold, there is a, uh, a differentiable manifold of even dimension and with a endomorphism f from tangent space to itself, where f square equal to minus i. That means f of fx, f of fx will be actually the identity mapping with the minus side. The concept, so that's why it is called almost complex manifold, as we know that i square equal to minus one. So here f square equal to minus i gives you the concept of almost complex structure. So the manifold, differentiable manifold with this type of f is called almost complex manifold. There is another important tensor field, which is called torsion tensor field on this almost complex manifold. This is the uh, Nijenhaus tensor is called, it is called Nijenhaus tensor and the properties of Nijenhaus tensor is there. The definition is this one with respect to F. Now the important is that uh, if the Nijenhaus tensor vanishes, it is called complex manifold. If the Nijenhaus tensor vanishes, nx y equal to zero, then almost complex manifold is called complex manifold. And it gives the concept of integrability on the complex manifold also this NXY, that is the importance of this Nijenhaus tensor. Now there is a concept of almost Hermite manifold. What is the meaning of Hermite? Hermite, I think you know, you have seen Hermite crab, Hermite crab or Hermite, uh, Hermite saints, you know, they, um, what I say, that they keep mum in every external influence. Okay, if you want to influence, it will not influenced by the this external part. So this is the concept of Hermite. So almost Hermite manifold. If you try to influence this the vector fields with f, it will remain same. So g of f x f y is equals to g x y. So with this metric, with this Riemannian metric. This is called Hermite manifold. The M with this G, F is there. So G and uh, so, sorry, the manifold M and the F, there is almost complex manifold. Now, if N is zero, the Nijenhaus tensor is zero, it is gives you complex manifold. Now, if there is G, where G of Fx Fy equal to G of Xy, then it is called almost Hermite manifold. So these are the properties of some. Uh, almost Hermite manifold. 
Now, this is the concept of Tyler manifold. That means again, the concept of parallelism here that del x f y equal to zero is called Tyler manifold. Almost Hermite manifold with which del x f y equal to zero. That means the covariant derivative of x of f y equal to zero. Then it is called Tyler manifold. So these are the properties of Tyler manifold, the curvature tensors, the properties of curvature tensors of the Tyler manifold. Uh, there are some uh, properties I have given. A projectively flat Kyler manifold uh, is flat. A projectively flat Kyler manifold, projective curvature tensor is given. Projective curvature tensor means if you give some projection operator on that manifold, then it curvature will not remain same. This one is the curvature. It will change according to this rule. And so this this is the projective curvature tensor, we say. And if it is flat, then PXYZ is 0, then uh, a projectively flat Kyler manifold is a manifold. Uh, is a, it is a flat manifold. It is a flat manifold. OK. Now almost contact manifold. There is another extra structure. If M is a even odd dimensional manifold, see this is an odd dimensional manifold. And if there are some one one tensor field, a vector field, one form, which satisfies these conditions. So with this one, see for the previous one, it is F square X equal to minus X. But now it is F five square X equal to minus X plus eta X J. So another term for odd dimension. And another concept is there eta J equal to one. So with these two conditions, we call it is almost contact structure. Now in this almost contact structure is very much useful in our fluid mechanics in PD. Okay. So uh, this is the example of a five dimensional uh, almost contact manifold. And if there, there is exist a metric, we call this almost contact metric manifold. And we have given an example of almost contact metric manifold. Now there is a K contact manifold. Uh, if the J is a killing vector field, killing vector field means this L J of G equal to zero. L J G equal to zero. Then it is called K contact manifold. K contact. K means the killing. Killing is K is capital because this is the name of a scientist. Okay. It is the name of a scientist. So that's why it is giving killing K as a capital. So these are the properties. I'm not going to the all these things. And this is a concept of contact manifold. For a contact manifold, these conditions hold eta wedge d eta to the power n not equal to zero. Now, this is the important uh, one. Then an almost contact metric manifold is called a contact manifold or contact metric manifold if d eta x y is g of x phi y. So if these conditions hold, then it is the contact metric manifold. Now we come to the application part of these things. Now, the Ricci Soliton uh, in 1982, the Ricci flow was introduced by Hamilton to prove the uh, geometric conjecture of Thurston and then Poincare uh, <clears throat> and then it is proved by Perelman but, but uh, in 1982 Hamilton in the paper of uh, differential geometry in the journal of differential geometry uh, in the paper he has introduced the concept of Ricci flow and with the help of this concept Perelman proved the Poincare conjecture uh, so, Ricci flow is the evaluation of the Riemannian metric, what we have done earlier, the Riemannian metric uh, on a smooth manifold by del del t of gt equal to minus 2s. Here, s is the Ricci curvature. That's why it is called Ricci flow. Now, if we, cons if we change this part, it gives some other flow that if we, if we change this s by some uh, mean curvature, then we call it as a mean curvature flow. Okay, so 
del del t of gt equals to minus 2s then s is a ricci tensor so actually the, why this minus 2 is coming it is coming from the concept of the heat equation flow so it is a very uh, large paper of hamilton uh, almost uh, uh, 100 pages paper so so this this gives you the concept of ricci flow and from there is also a concept of ricci soliton and by generalizing that one we have defined the uh, this is the concept of ricci soliton the s plus half of lvg l is the lie derivative of b along g plus lambda g equal to 0 where lambda is a constant and l is the lie derivative so this is the ricci soliton equation <clears throat> the ricci soliton appears as a self semi cellular solution to hamilton's ricci flow it is a self similar solution that means there is a restriction on this ricci flow okay and it is parameterized if the ricci flow is parameterized or do some scaling on that ricci flow we get the ricci soliton and and it is the arises as a limit of dilation of singularities in the ricci flow and it is the generalization of einstein matrix and it it is sinking steady or expanding it depends upon the value of lambda if lambda is less than 0 it is sinking is lambda equal to 0 it is a steady ricci soliton and if lambda greater than 0 it is a expanding so this is an example of a sigar soliton it is an example of a sigar soliton for the metric this one it gives you the example of a sigar soliton and uh, we can consider this one as a potential vector field and for the actually for this gradient ricci soliton we need this potential function f okay so gradient ricci soliton if this uh, for this concept if this lvf is replaced by this del del f del square f or del del f then it gives you the gradient ricci soliton now in 2015 we have introduced the conformal ricci soliton in like this one where the p is the scalar non dynamic dynamical field and it is a time dependent scalar field n is the dimension of the manifold then it gives you the conformal ricci soliton now there is another concept of warp product now warp product is a very generalization of surface of revolution i think you know the cylinder cylinder is actually one type of surface of revolution because there is a uh, there is a base circular base and with the uh, heights are the it is the line of uh, just revolution and if we just revolve we get the surface of revolution so there is a base space and there is a fiber there is a fiber is there so that fibers are the denoted by fgf and b is the base space b is the manifold with the metric and a are the fibers and there are two dependent manifolds and it is the product manifold b cross a similarly the cylinder can be written as s1 cross r cylinder can be written as s1 cross r s1 is the circle is the base and r is the your fiber and there are the some projection maps from b cross f to b and sigma b cross f to f and it is called warp product because this function is very important depending on the function you can change the shape of the surface you can change the shape of the surface you know that if you want to do some uh, you can uh, do some surface with the mods by by the hand you can by the pressure of hand you can change the uh, you can change the uh, pattern of the surfaces so that is the f f is the function which changes the pattern of the surfaces so b is the base and f is the fiber and the function f is called the warping function and what product is called a simply riemannian product if f is a constant function 
okay and it is a multiple work product if there is a base and there are different types of fiber generally this is the general case where the fibers are of different types you know that uh, the fibers are not the same type but for the cylinder the fibers are same it is a just real line but that these fibers may be some different things and the matrix will be like this the multiple generalized robertson walker space time is a example of a uh, of a work product space where the base is the only the this one interval and there are different fibers are there so multiple generalized robertson walker space time is an example of work product space there is a concept of quarter symmetric connection also there and if we consider txy the torsion tensor field we know that this is del xy minus del y x minus lie bracket xy and together this one we have txy equals to omega y phi x minus omega x phi y so now uh, i can uh, uh, one request uh, can you finish it by uh, uh, okay, okay thank you yeah. sorry two or three minutes uh, two, just i'm showing the results yeah okay 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 sorry okay, I'm, i'm not going to the definitions of these things uh, quasi einstein manifold is a generalization of einstein manifold now the come to the our some results because this is the research part where we have that uh, if m if a riemannian manifold m is locally multiple work product then m admits a torque vector field or just definition is torque vector field is given here there is a torque vector field uh, this is a torque vector field okay the exact definition of torque vector field is there and the torque forming vector field is the definition of torque forming vector field so there are some vector fields which gives you some uh, turbulence actually con circular concurrent or recurrent all these things so so these results we have proved in our different papers so a conformal rich soliton with torque potential field tau is einstein if and only if tau is a con circular vector field and this is another uh, another result let m be a multiple work product then there's uh, also assume that the work product is a gradient rich soliton then this happens if xy belongs to chi b then if i are constants and the potential functions depend only on the base the f is depends only on the base and these are the results uh if it is a work product function and let m be a gradient rich soliton and psi is a potential function then this results hold okay so these are some theorems uh, which we have uh, proved in our different papers i am not going to the all the things so this is an example of a multiple generalized robertson walker space time and these are the some references uh the main thing is that the paper uh, the paper consists of these papers uh this one uh is a uh, sompat buddhadev and myself as uh, this one is a uh, multiple work products on as quasi einstein manifolds with a quasi quarter symmetric connection it is in trieste italy is published and this one is on um, Rich soliton and iterated rich soliton on generalized Sasakian space form on Philomat, and this one is another another for the torque vector fields with Tomalika and Chompa, and this was in Nirobro and what is uh, in 2015. And last but not the least, I must thank to Shumonjit also who has helped me a lot for preparing these uh, slides by gathering all these uh, concepts in a nutshell. Uh, so. that is a uh, i think uh, i must end here thank you yeah uh, thank you professor bhattacharya for your uh, very very wonderful yeah. talk comprehensive uh, detailed work on the differentiable manifolds and you just talked on different applications of this differentiable manifolds so thanks to you and now i just uh, mm -hmm. ask the organizers if uh, there is any question coming from the audience please
हेलो सर यस हेलो एक्चुअली सर आई हैव सीन अ क्वेश्चन इन द चैट बॉक्स एंड इट टोल्स दैट हाउ वी कैन यूज वन पैरामीटर ग्रुप ऑफ ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन इन मैथमेटिकल बायोलॉजी बिकॉज देयर इज अ कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ ऑर्बिट देयर इज अ कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ ऑर्बिट एंड जेनरेटर्स नाउ इन मैथमेटिकल बायोलॉजी यू कैन सी दैट द uh this orbits and uh, generators are used so in that way there are the system of differential equations and that system of differential equations give you the integral curves and the uh, one parameter group of transformations so in that way you can relate with the mathematical biology okay thank you thank you sir thank you can any, any other question from others is the things are understandable uh, my voice voice is clear yeah it was clear very much yes, clear yes yes sir yes sir clear mm. oh stop sure. have you uh, understand this yes sir yes sir so well uh, if, if there is, is no more question then let us thank the speaker uh, professor inna bhattacharya once again and uh, he actually developed uh, the different uh, his own way and own school of research in differentiable manifolds he introduced certain other concepts in differentiable manifolds as i know and as he has delivered uh, different things uh, he has his members and collaborators and students developed and uh, he has given a very comprehensive idea about all the things and certainly he started from the very basics of the differentiable manifolds he talked on different aspects different branches different openings of this uh, particular issue and then he actually focused on his research area and convergent area of the differentiable manifold part so let us thank professor adnan bhattacharya once again and uh, over to the organizers for the i thank i, I also thank, thank to koshik and the organizers for uh, giving me chance to share with your uh, all these uh, members and the research scholars and uh, i think there are pg and ug students are also there so i thank all of you okay thank you very much sir thank you okay thank you so we'll meet again uh, at 2:30 uh yes this is the end of our technical session 1 and we will return uh 1:40 sir since we have 10 minutes late left yes sir okay. we are late 10 minutes so we will be back on 1:40 Okay. 140 or 240? Uh, sir, to, sorry, 240. 240. Yes, 240. Okay. Okay. okay.